Yes. Okay, so welcome back to um, Korean seminar. I hope you all had a nice Thanksgiving. Uh, today's speaker is Tessa Fisher. Uh, Tessa got bachelor's degree in both astronomy and biology. Mm -hmm. Perfect for this. And then I got PhD at ASU in ge geological sciences. And she then joined uh, 2023 and then yep. joined us in Eleanor team um, from this uh, fourth semester. Uh, we welcome you here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this is interested in applying ecology and complex system science to astrobiology. And also, of course, uh, applying to search for life beyond Earth and um, especially habitability, uh, bio, bio signature science. So here today we'll hear um, about atmospheric chemical reaction network topology as a potential bio signature for exoplanets, Tessa. Thank yes. you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. So. As most of you probably know, we are reaching into the era where it may be at least in principle possible to spectrally analyze the atmospheres of Earth-like exoplanets. Just very exciting. And of course, as an astrobiologist, my immediate question is, how can we use this new data to figure out if there's stuff living on these planets or not? However, it turns out that's easier said than done. Uh, we run into a couple problems. It turns out it's pretty difficult to say with confidence to be able to go from a spectral pattern or spectroscopy, spectroscopic data to being able to say that, oh yeah, there's a thriving biosphere on this planet. Um, and that's for a couple of reasons. Uh, previously in astrobiology, we mostly focused on sort of these smoking gun molecules where we assumed that, oh, if we see oxygen in a planet's atmosphere, most of the oxygen on Earth comes from chlorophyll, from plants. Therefore, there must be life there. Same thing for methane, uh, dimethyl, disulfur, DSMO, methyl sulfur oxide, there we go. Um, um, some nitro nitrogen compounds as well, um, which made it seem like it would be pretty easy to be able to see, say, if there's life on the planet or not. But as we've learned more about the diversity of worlds, which far exceeds what the type of planets we find in our own solar system, and as we've gotten better at modeling the evolution of those worlds, we've realized that there's actually quite a high risk of false positives if we just look at those smoking gun compounds, for example, with oxygen. Turns out if you are on a water-rich planet that is orbiting a star that has a lot of UV activity, it can photodissociate the water vapor in the atmosphere, hydrogen escapes in space, run that forward for a couple million years, and you can get appreciable amounts of oxygen with absolutely no biological activity whatsoever. Um, and that's true for a lot of these other sort of smoking gun molecules that people have been looking at. So that's a problem. Another problem is that we've been assuming that most of the life that we could find out there will be like us. It will use water as a solvent, carbon as its foundational building block, probably it's aerobic, inhale oxygen, exhale carbon dioxide, et cetera. Um, but we don't necessarily know if that's gonna be true for other biospheres. And it, as a result, it can be hard to predict what gases might be biologically relevant if we're talking about biochemistry that's radically different from our own. We have some guesses, but again, we just don't know those um, biochemistries as well as we know our own for obvious reasons. So based off all of this, it seems like we're gonna need a different approach, a different way of thinking about this challenge. And uh, as Serena said, you know, my background is originally in ecology, although I've been all over the place academically, um, and a lot in complex system science. And so naturally I looked at this and tried to think about it less as, oh, we're looking for this one specific molecule. Maybe we should be looking for patterns of interactions instead because that's what we see in biospheres. You don't find, or very rarely anyways, find environments on this planet where there's only a single organism or single class of organisms that's giving out a specific, you know, biologically relevant gas or metabolite um, instead, you find it in a complex web of interactions between other organisms and their physical environment. So maybe that's where we need to be looking instead. 
and a really good way to sort of represent, study, and visualize these um, patterns of interactions is using network theory, um, which is basically you can take any complex system and represent it as a network by assigning each subcomponent of the system a point or node in the vernacular, and then connecting them based off of how they interact with each other. Um, these connections are also known as edges. Um, and this seemed like it would be a natural fit for what we're looking for. Um, a very intuitive way to understand these patterns of interactions, which may or may not indicate the presence of life. But this sounds very, very abstract. So I'm gonna give you a more concrete example. Network theory was mostly developed originally to look at social networks. So that's what I'm gonna start with. Let's say you have a hypothetical group of friends or and you know, some people on this list are friends with others, but not friends with some other of the people. And you can stare at this list until your eyes cross, but it's a lot more intuitive to understand it if you visualize it as a network. Um, and not only that, you can now do quantified analysis of the sort of shape and patterns in that network. Um, there are many metrics that we can look at that'll tell us something about this network. Uh, one, for example, is degree, which is actually pretty simple. It's the number of connections that go into a given node. The mean degree is the average degree, as the name suggests, of any given node in a network. Um, so basically, you take the degrees of all the nodes, add them up, and get the average. So in this case, we can find that this network has a mean degree of 2.3, which in practice means that on average, each person in this network is... 2.3 friends with other people, has 2.3 connections to someone else in the network. It's a bit like, uh, well, actually, no, I'm gonna hit myself. Um, another measurement is the shortest path length, which as the name suggests, is just the shortest distance between any two points or nodes in the network. You can also get the average shortest path length, which is the same thing. It's the average, average shortest path for the entire network. Um, again, pretty self-explanatory. And you can take this measurement as well. Um, you find out that uh, the average shortest path length is 1.54 for this network, which means on average, each person is 1.54 people removed from any other person in this network. It's a bit like that old party game, Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, if any of y'all are familiar with that, or Erdos number, another example. Um, so looking at these numbers, we can actually get a more rigorous way of understanding sort of the structure and shape and dynamics of a network. And this will come in handy. Now you may be asking yourself, this is great, what does it have to do with exoplanets and atmospheres and chemistry? Well, you can actually do the same thing with chemical reactions. You know, take this very simple set of equations and you can represent them as a network by assigning each individual species a point in the network and then connecting to them to each other based off of what reactions they co-participate with. And, you know, as you may notice, this is the exact shape network of the previous one. Um, and it has the same measurements, uh, mean degree of 2.3, which in this case means each species on average reacts with 2.3 other species in this set of chemical reactions. And an average source path length of 1.54, which means each species is only about 1.54 reactions removed from any other species. And that's not all you can do with networks. You can actually um, include more information about the system that you're looking at by weighting the connections. Um, so in this case, let's say, for example, that we've weighted the edges, the connections between these points by physical distance. That these numbers, these weights, represent how far geographically one point is from another. Now, if you wanted to know the shortest path between points A and point C, if this were an unweighted network, it'd be easy to go from A to B to C. However, if we incorporate the weights and assume that they represent, for example, physical distance, um, you can, the shortest path would actually be going from A to B to D to C, because that would have a weighted length of five, whereas going from A to B to C would have a weighted length of six. So basically, this is a really useful way for incorporating other information we know about the relationships between the subcomponents of the network that we're studying. 
Now, what got us interested in this idea in the first place was that way back in 2004, a couple of network scientists, Soleil and Montanu, decided to apply this method to all the major planetary atmospheres in our solar system, mostly because they were just curious to see what would happen. And this is just another one of their sample networks to give you an idea of how to build a chemical reaction network. Um, and what they found is that most of the, in fact, pretty much all of the planetary atmospheres in our solar system, the network representation looks something like this, sort of this jumbled mess of spaghetti. However, when they looked at Earth's chemical reaction network for its atmosphere, they found this. And which is a pretty striking difference. It has a sense of organization that the other networks did not have. It has some features, it's hierarchical in that, or rather I should say it's modular in that you can break it down into self-similar sub-networks and it's hierarchical in that those sub-networks feed into each other. From a quantified point of view, the mean degree and clustering coefficients, which is another network measurement, are much, much lower than any other planetary atmosphere in our solar system. And this result was later replicated by um, a paper by Wong and colleagues that came out, I think, earlier this year, if I recall correctly. So what is the main difference that caused the actual meta difference? That's the million dollar question. <laughs> Our assumption is that it is likely due to the presence of life or specifically the um, gases that are being emitted by biological processes. Because the thing is, we see this sort of pattern of, you know, this modular, this hierarchicalness, um, and also, especially with a, it's not exactly a power law distribution, but the fact that you have a few nodes with a lot of connections, but most nodes have very few connections, you see that pattern in most biochemical networks as well at any scale, all the way up from individual cells and gene regulatory networks, all the way up to metabolic networks across whole ecosystems. So we're assuming that if this is indeed a sign of life, it is probably due to the fact that the atmosphere and the biosphere are so tightly interfaced on this planet that the network structure of the, bio of the biochemistry is in turn influencing the network structure of the atmospheric chemistry. So that's our hypothesis. So we thought this was pretty cool. But like I said, Soleil and Montanu were network scientists who had mostly done this for funsies. They weren't atmospheric chemists or planetary scientists or astronomers. Um, and so we wanted to sort of replicate the approach they were taking, but in a much more rigorous way. Um, and first we wanted to see, can we even use network topology to infer anything about the physical and chemical state of an atmosphere. You know, we wanted a proof of concept. And we decided we didn't want to start with like Earth-like planets because there are a lot of moving parts. We wanted something simple before we charged headlong into this. So we looked at hot Jupiters first. Now you may be asking why hot Jupiters? Pretty sure they're pretty much completely inhospitable to any form of life we know. Well, like I said, they're simple. There are only a, a couple of drivers for their sort of thermochemical activity, basically their initial composition, their temperature, and what pressure you are sampling the atmosphere from. You know, so basically, you know, what section of the atmosphere are we getting spectral data from? Um, and on top of that, as a bonus, it's just a nifty little aside, um, it turns out the, because the conditions on hot Jupiters in terms of sort of the gas mix and the temperature and pressure are actually pretty similar to what you find in internal combustion engines, there's actually a wealth of chemical uh, kinetics data from the car companies that we can use in creating our models, which saves us some trouble. So basically what we do is that we modeled a population of hot Jupiters with varying initial compositions and temperatures. Um, we extracted the reaction list of all the reactions that were thermochemically favorable to happen. Um, and then built a network, like I said, by assigning each species a point and then connecting them based off of what reactions they co-participate in. And then weighting those connections by the flux, the amount of uh, reactant that is being converted to product um, for each connection from its uh, 
correlating reaction that it's representing. And then we did a whole bunch of analysis on the resulting networks. Um, and what we were trying to figure out specifically is if we could distinguish um, how far away the atmosphere was from equilib thermochemical equilibrium, um, because life really likes, as a process, really likes to also move atmospheres away from equilibrium. So we figured that would be a good thing to check. Um, and the way we quantified that by was looking at the vertical mixing coefficient, KZZ. If you're not familiar with these sorts of models, KZZ is basically how much mixing there is between the different layers of the atmosphere. KZZ equals zero. You assume your atmosphere is completely stratified and each layer is uniform and they will vary, the, each layer will very quickly come to thermochemical equilibrium. If your KZZ is above zero and you've got mixing between the layers, it will move you away from equilibrium because, for example, you might be dredging up species that are easy to form, relatively speaking, in sort of the hot, dense lower layers up into the cooler, less dense, um, higher layers uh, at a rate that's faster than they can be dissipated through uh, thermochemical reactions. So basically, the larger the KZZ is, the farther you are from equilibrium. Uh, and we got some cool results. And specifically what we were excited about is that we actually used uh, the thermo the network parameters um, as the basis for a machine learning algorithm. And then we created a machine al learning algorithm for some of the other parameters you could look at, like the amount of water vapor or methane in your atmosphere. And we tested them against each other to see um, basically what was going to give us a more accurate prediction given a set of data from hot Jupiters to how far away it was from equilibrium, what its KZZ was, because like I said, that's the thing we were investigating. And it turns out that the network parameters, which are pretty much the bottom five, um, do really well. And the, more than that, they do really well over a range of temperatures. Um, all the way from 400 Kelvin up to 2000 Kelvin. So this was really in terms of their accuracy in predicting the KZZ values. So that was really exciting to see. And I've got some more graphics elsewhere if you're interested, but honestly, as an astrobiologist, I'm not really that interested in hot Jupiters. So I'm gonna move on to the cool stuff. So I have a question. So what are the blue lines compared to the other? Um... The blue line is the parameter yeah. um, that is, being tested, the gray lines are the other parameters. So, you know, uh, CO is this gray line here, 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 and here. Oh, no, so it's basically just an yeah, easy yeah, way yeah. to compare their, um, how accurate they are to each other. Um, but yeah, so anyways, we took this as a very exciting initial result and moved on to looking at terrestrial worlds. And of course, this is when things get a bit more complicated. Um, to do this, we modeled planets with and without life. And you know, then we figured we'd compare the network topology and evaluate it as a biosignature. We also, because I had a little bit of extra time, decided to let's not do more than just biosignatures. Let's do something else. Let's look at industrial compounds too, because you know, studies cool and fun nowadays. And I thought it would be interesting to see if you see similar things happen when you're looking at like fertile fluorocarbons or other compounds we normally associate with industrial emissions. Um, so to do this, we had six sets of models, um, and you can divide them up into, I guess, two groups. The first group, which has four models in it, we were looking at a very simple case of sort of the Archean Earth, so for the evolution of photosynthesis, and we assumed that there would be sort of four uh, sets of models that we would use. The first one is the control, where we have an Archean-like atmosphere, no life, it's just sitting there doing its thing. You might have, you do have some methane emissions, but they're mostly from pretty much all serpentization, so non-biological processes. In the second case, second set, we added a biosphere. It's not a very interesting biosphere. All it is is methanogens, but it's, they are pumping out a ton of methane, and they also have some uh, reactions in their network that the abiotic case does not represent biochemistry. You know, the conversion of 
carbon dioxide to methane via a biological pathway. Now, because we wanted to, you know, the whole idea was motivation for doing all this was we wanted to avoid false positives. We threw in a couple other cases for sort of the worst case scenario where, for example, you have a really high flux of methane coming off your planet's surface, but you don't actually know why. You don't know if there's life there or not. There's just a lot of methane coming off the planet for some reason. And then also we did a case which honestly is not very realistic in terms of atmosphere that could actually exist, but we included it anyways, just because we wanted to cover all bases, where there's not even a methane flux. Your planet just has a ton of methane hanging out in its atmosphere and is at steady state for no real reason, just, you know, but in all, in both these cases, we assumed that we could not, uh, that life could not be assumed to be on these planets for whatever reason, that we couldn't know for sure that, again, all we're seeing is the methane. Um, and in practice, that meant we did not include the biological pathways that I talked about that were included in the biotic model. Uh, and then the second set, um, or rather the second grouping, was the one I mentioned earlier where we're looking at industrial pollution. Um, that's a simpler set of cases where basically you have a modern Earth atmosphere without the emission of CFC-12 that are known as Freon, which is rather notorious for destroying the ozone layer. Um, and then we have a planet that unfortunately does have CFC-12 emissions. Um, again, not great for their ozone, but it's not our problem for, this, for the purposes of this um, analysis. So what we do is basically, um, like we did with the hot Jupiters, we would have a distribution of initial conditions for the various modeled atmospheres. And on average, each set had about 5,000 um, atmospheres uh, set up to run, although a number of them did not converge for one reason or another. Um, from those the models that did converge, oh yeah, we ran, uh, we ran them using Atmos, which is an open source um, planetary atmosphere model, one dimensional. Um, from the models that converge, we got a distribution. Um, we constructed them into networks. Um, and then we analyzed those networks using Network X, which is another open source Python package that's really good for doing network analysis. Um, got a distribution of network metrics. And then we use SciPy um, to determine if the distributions of networks that were drawn from models with life were statistically distinguishable from the distributions drawn from models without life. In other words, is this going to be a useful biosignature or not? Um, so for the Archean Earth, we modeled with red dwarf sun because we were thinking sort of like, okay, in terms of what we're actually going to realistically be able to observe in the near term, it's probably going to be around a red dwarf. Again, like I said, Archean Earth um, with methane, flux varying from 10 to the 3 all the way up to 10 to the 14 molecules per centimeter per second. And then for modern Earth, you had a CFC concentration varying from 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 0 parts per million. Now, one of the major statistical analyses we did was using the colman giernoff smirnoff test, um, which basically, if you have two distributions, you plug them into this analysis. Um, if you have the distributions are very similar to each other, you end up with a, it gives you a KS metric value or score, which is very low usually, and a P value, which represents how statistic, statistically significant it is, that's very high. Uh, um, so basically the more similar your distributions are, the closer you are gonna be to zero. Um, and usually higher the P value is because that suggests that whatever difference is present between those distributions, it's not very statistically significant. For very different distributions, the reverse is true. The closer you get to one, the more statistically distinguishable your distributions are, and the lower your p-value is, suggesting that those differences are statistically useful, distinctive. Um, so this is the, what we got out for comparing the different Archean Earth models. Um, and it turns out, uh, when you're comparing just to like the amount of methane in your atmosphere, which is how people had previously thought about this for the most part, um, the network metrics actually perform really well. And in a lot of cases, considerably outperform just looking at methane abundance alone. 
And that's especially in these sort of weird worst case scenarios that we talked about, where you have similar amounts of methane in your atmosphere as sort of biological case, but you don't actually necessarily have life there. Um, and that's also reflected in the KS values. Um, mean degree, for example, scores almost a, a score of one comparing between the biological and non-biological atmospheres. Um, and even in the worst case scenarios, um, another one of the met metrics we looked at, average short path length, performed really well um, and certainly outperforms methane abundance alone. So yay, this is working the way we hoped it would. Very cool. Uh, now to make sure that this wasn't just a fluke and that these atmospheric models are actually telling us something useful or rather this network analysis is actually telling us something useful about the planets we're looking at. We decided we'd also do some perturbation testing where basically we just kind of went out of our way to break the model and see if the network metrics were detected or not. Specifically, we removed uh, the loss of a, removed acetylene, which uh, plays a role in being a sink of methane reduction, at least in theory. Um, and it turns out, interestingly enough, while the methane abundance didn't change all that much, I suspect because um, the removal just shifted to a different sink reaction with acetylene gone, um, the network metrics really, really, really picked up on it. Um, you know, we have even higher KS values than we did looking at the last set. So that was also reassuring that, you know, this isn't just some sort of fluke that, you know, these network metrics are actually telling us something about the state of the atmosphere. And finally, these are the results for a modern Earth. Um, and again, we kind of did this at the tail end, so it's not as developed as the stuff of the Archean Earth, but still, we've got very high network metrics or high confidence network metrics, in some cases with a KS value close to one, for being able to distinguish between the distribution of models that did have freon emissions and the ones that did not. So again, this could also potentially pave the way for a techno signature for people who are looking at um, industrial pollution as a sign of technolo technology in a planetary atmosphere. Now, one other thing we wanted to do, and this was actually inspired by some of the work that Antonin Affolder has done over in Regis's lab was we decided let's plug this into a Bayesian approach. If we use these network metrics as a prior um, for determining the probability of any given observation being a sign of life on that planet, how does it do? Um, and actually, it turns out it does really well. Um, in fact, Ironically, what it seems to be most useful as isn't necessarily a biosignature, but as an anti-biosignature. What I mean by that is that depending on how common you assume life is in the universe, because that was a parameter we kept free, was the probability of life all the, from 0 0.001 all the way up to 0 0.9. Um, if you're given, if you measure a given amount of methane in the atmosphere, let's say uh, 10 to the 1 parts per million, depending on how common you think life is in the universe, that will give you a probability of that methane being a sign of life anywhere from probably somewhere around 70% confidence to close to zero, which is a pretty big range. Um, and, you know, doesn't exactly inspire necessarily a lot of faith that, oh yeah, this is definitely a biosignature or for that matter, that it's definitely not a biosignature. Uh, however, if you look at the same planet, and do this network analysis and find that it's log mean degree is 12.5, you can say that, oh yeah, there's absolutely no way that there's life here because we do not see mean degree values with any percentage of probability that have of that uh, magnitude that have life. So again, ironically, this may be most useful as an anti signature for helping us, yes, Jerry, can you clarify this in my mind? Is it saying that there's no evidence for life or that there's evidence against life? Ooh, that is a good question. Um, the way we model it, uh, I would assume that it's evidence that there isn't life because for our, the sort of the 
uh, inverts that we're looking at, we specifically looked at planets where we had it excluded biology, uh, the models rather. Um, so yeah, I would say that this would be evidence that there is not life. Not just that, you know, there's a lack of evidence for life. Because as you point out, those aren't necessarily the same thing. Um, now, admittedly, that may change uh, as these uh, modeling we're doing gets more sophisticated. We may discover that, you know, it's not this clear cut. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case. But again, for this very simple set of planets where, you know, it's just methanogens and nothing else, that seems to be the case. Um, in particular, mean degree and average source path length in all the cases we looked at seem to perform the strongest in terms of distinguishing between either planets with life and without life or planets with technology and without technology. Um, my suspicion is that because these metrics are particularly sensitive to changes in, oh, that should be edge weight, uh, not node weight, uh, in the weight of the edges, so basically how much flux is going through reactions, um, which I suspect has to do with the fact that when you introduce life, you get some species that are very reactive, and there's only a few of them, but they participate in a lot of reactions and produce a lot of products. Um, and like I said, that the Bayesian approach suggests potential use as an anti-biosignature. So beyond this, um, well, first off, what are we gonna do next? Um, and obviously for this to be a useful biosignature, we have to be able to link it to the observations, the data we're actually gonna be getting back from James Webb or Plato or Louvoir or you know any of the extremely large ground-based telescopes that are in the works. Um, so we're gonna have to figure out how many species do we need to be able to identify in the atmosphere to actually make a network where we can do this sort of analysis and get useful results back. And something else I've been looking into is can we directly infer the network metrics from looking the, at the spectral data alone? Um, this is still very early on, but right now I'm using a, um, oh God, uh, a type of statistical analysis called um, Latin class, Latin class analysis, which is a method that my sister, who's a psychologist, turned me on, a, um, well, a population psychologist, suggested to me, because she uses a lot where basically you can't necessarily see the variables that you're looking for, you can just infer them. And it's really good for distinguishing between classes within a population that you can't necessarily directly observe. So we're gonna give that a shot and see how that turns out. Um, beyond that, like I said, as I alluded to, I'd love to do uh, atmospheres where the biosphere is more complex since it's unlikely you're gonna see a planet that's just methanogens, you're gonna have heterotrophs, you're gonna have other anaerobes that might be producing other biological species to say nothing of oxygenic photosynthesis. And in particular, as I alluded to earlier, O2 is one of those gases that we assumed was a surefire bet, but it turns out you can produce it abiotically. So I'd like to see how this stacks up using this approach stacks up in distinguishing between these sort of abiotic scenarios versus planets that actually have biological photosynthesis happening. Um, honestly, the only reason that hasn't happened yet is because at one point it was a part of this work uh, is that we couldn't get the abiotic O2 models to work properly hoping we'll be able to fix that, but they, they kept on breaking as it turned out. Um, but yeah, so stay tuned. Hopefully we will have more exciting stuff. Uh, and I guess more relevant to stuff that's happening in Alien Earth, I'm also hoping to integrate some of the stuff, if it works eventually, into Bioverse as well, um, which would be really nifty to do. Um, that is probably a bit further down the road. Uh, any questions? Uh, you said the network models uh, were done for solar system bodies with atmospheres. Like there are some moons that are very high probability, or they want to explore them for signs of life, like subsurface oceans yeah. and whatnot. How how do those networks compare to say Earth's network? And could you just use this network analysis? To that basically is say another thing we're working on here actually is, um, so we obviously we don't know as much about the chemistry that's happening, you know, 
on Europa or Enceladus underneath the ocean. We have a little bit from Enceladus. Uh, for Enceladus in, in particular, I have been using a related approach called network expansion, which is basically you take all the compounds that you know are present in a given chemical environment, you plug them into the keg database of enzymes, which is pretty much all the enzymes in, in you known terrestrial biology and see what products you can produce out of them. Then you take those products and you add them to the original set, feed it back into keg, see what new products that you can produce then and on and on and on until you can't produce any new products. Um, so we are working on building a network that way um, and then seeing how, um, what the network topology might look like. Um, honestly though, I would, I would need more data to really use this approach um, in particular because the analyses that have been done, uh, one of my old lab mates actually had a paper about, out about this, I guess a year or two ago, when they did it for the Enceldus data they got back from Cassini, what they found was that terrestrial biochemistry would not be able to sustain itself there. Um, because it actually mostly what was missing was uh, a lot of the trace minerals they need. For example, I don't think they found any manganese and at least in terrestrial biology, it turns out manganese is really important um, for a lot of reactions. Um, so, yeah, basically we need more data, but you could apply this to, you know, if you get actual samples from, you know, Enceladus' plume and something that isn't originally designed to look at cosmic dust. Yeah, we could do this sorts of analysis. And I would be curious to see how it shows up. I know here on Earth, most oceanic biochemical networks have the similar structure as Earth's atmosphere. Um, I had a couple questions, actually. Sure, go for so it. The first one was um, <clears throat> related to like the what you mentioned slash what I always talk about when we have this conversation, which is how does this affect what we're actually able to observe? Um, I was wondering, like, it, if you um, apply like a cut in just abundance or something and only show the most abundant Earth um, gases. That's what I want to do. Does the network still look different from, because I, I was also wondering, like, is, is part of the thing that's driving the reason the Earth network looks different, just that we have much more detailed information on the Earth's atmosphere? Yeah, that's actually, like, uh, when I talked about, like, the minimum number of species required, that's exactly the sort of thing I had in mind. Okay. Um, I have done some of that work. Um, for example, I've decided, okay, I'm going to reduce, remove all the sulfur species in Earth's atmosphere, because, you know... Those don't seem to be, unless you're looking maybe at some of the S8 aerosols, don't seem to be super observable, at least from anything that I've heard. I haven't heard anybody detecting them. So, and it turns out if you remove all those, yes, you can still distinguish. But, you know, I'm given that we're only talking, you know, realistically, we're only maybe going to look at at most a dozen species, at least in the near term. And that's being very optimistic. I'm going to have to like trim it back even further. My hope is that, yes. You know, even if we're just looking at a handful of species, we'll be able to see the networks and the distinguish between them, but I don't know yet. Okay, cool. And then my second question, completely unrelated to that, I know that the, the like biotic signatures thing is your main thing, but I thought that the, the hot Jupiter network that you built is mm. also really interesting. And I was wondering, I think a couple of weeks ago, Everidge Flowen gave a talk here on this JWST program where they've been looking for methane to try and detect disequilibrium chemistry. Mm -hmm. And they have a couple published spectra. Or oh, at this least is new one. to me. Yeah, this sounds cool. Yeah, on hot Jupiter. So I was wondering if you can use your your network that you made to analyze those spectra kind of and, oh, yeah. and get the same results. Yeah, I just got to like, you know, get a... I am not properly speaking an atmospheric chemist. I'm a, like I said, my background's in ecology, but if someone can help me set up a, you know, a retrieval model that'll give us, you know, the abundances. Yeah, we could do that. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I'm not involved with that group actually. I just went to his talk a couple weeks ago. But yeah, hypothetically, yes, yeah. it could be done. <laughs> I think he's online, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the talk is online and you, we can connect definitely. With okay. Him. I am here, Everett was here. Everett's there, yeah, yeah. yeah please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's really that's exciting. Really yeah. Exciting. So that's yeah. what I was wondering if you can uh, incorporate the uncertainties in these abundant. Like, I was wondering if if all the results you presented so far were like you know the abundances exactly, and then he, for the hot Jupiters, we actually did incorporate um, a lot of uncertainty, especially in the temperature. Um, for the Archean Earth, um, 
because incorporating uncertainties got really complicated because we're we for the hot Jupiters we used Vulcan, which is a more recent package compared to Atmos, which is written in Fortran and is a bear to work with. Um, so we didn't really look at uncertainty for the Earth models, but for the hot Jupiters, yeah, we did have uncertainties factored. And at least looking at temperature, we were still able to distinguish based off of the, the accurately predict how far away from you were from disequilibrium up to uncertainties as high as 500 Kelvin in temperature. So yes, we can incorporate uncertainty into that. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, let's, let's be in so touch. Cool. It becomes real now, becoming real now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> uh, I think the next was Sarah. Yeah, I just want to um, sort of plug next week's origin speaker is Luis Volbanks, who is the retrieval person on um, the program that Everett is talking about. Uh, so we should try to make sure that you two get time to meet up maybe also with Everett so that you can really chat through this because it sounds like something yeah. to pursue. Yeah, that's, that does sound good. So next next Monday. Yeah, I'll um, make sure to be can here. come to the other place. The one yeah, yeah, it's Stuart. Yeah. Um, okay, so the, I think I need to ask if I listen first, and then we'll go to uh, the bank later. I uh, said, so Alison, would you like to uh, unmute and say? <laughs> sure. Um, so I was just wondering, you know, it, you talk about a minimum number of reactions, but I imagine there must be a minimum diversity of reactions as well. So if you had like a hundred reactions involving methanol, but nitrogen was nowhere to be found that would be not the most useful thing in the world that so is there like yeah. you know minimum we need to target four molecules that can each contain one of carbon nitrogen oxygen hydrogen that sort of thing or i haven't experimented with that yet but that would be my intuition is that yeah if you, you know you've got 100 reactions and they all have more or less the same stuff in them you're probably not going to see just because of the nature of how chemistry works, you're just not going to really see distinguishable differences between the networks. Um, so is there a, you know, I understand this is tricky because you don't want to assume what type of, of chemistry is involved in extraterrestrial biological processes, but are there, um, you know, some key molecules that, that would be important to get in terms of targeting observations, for instance, um, if I were in I the not, not near future <laughs> planning spectroscopic observations. Yes, yeah, I don't know yet. Um, my suspicion is that that probably will be. Um, I, I had to guess if we're looking for a bias biochemistry that's similar to our own, oxygen is going to be important um, because that does participate a lot. Um, but honestly, I would probably actually say nitrogen might be even more important than that um, based off of just what little I have seen so far. Um, so yeah, I don't know what species are gonna be important, but I think your intuition is correct. I think there will be some that we need to find if we're actually gonna use this approach. I just can't tell you which ones they are yet. <laughs> yep, All right, thank you. Okay, now Venkateswara, do you have a question? Uh, hi, um, uh, I have a question, yes. Uh, the <laughs> network of reactions and uh, the network structure as a whole is dictated by the underlying non-equilibrium thermodynamics and kinetics. Um, so I'm wondering actually the network metrics and parameters which you are finally modeling or obtaining can be validated based on the underlying non-equilibrium or disequilibrium thermo, as you are calling, thermodynamics and thermochemistry of these network of reactions. Yeah, actually, and that is something we had discussed. We haven't really implemented it because, again, I'm not an atmospheric chemist, so I'm not sure how one would go about doing that. I'm sure there's a way, though. Um, but yeah, no, that would actually be something really interesting to see, um, especially since even if you're looking at the equilibrium cases, as I understand it, in a lot of the kinetics data, there's a lot of uncertainty uncertainty to begin with and sort of the fundamental chemical rates. Um, so yeah, um, I would think doing that would be really cool and it was something that I would like to see. Okay, thank you. So I have one question. Uh, I don't know, in the future, you know, the dragonfly will go to Titan. Mm -hmm. Do you expect that there will be an interesting 
Uh, Titan is also on my list of atmospheres I would like to analyze using this, especially since because of all the photochemistry, you've got a lot of chemical complexity right. that's happening. And I think that would also be like a useful test case for, okay, can we distinguish between this really fascinating soup of chemistry that so far as we know so far does not have life in it versus a case where there we do assume that there's life problems and you know how that might fit into a methogenic biosphere. All right. Any other question? Okay. Yeah. Maybe you mentioned this and I missed it. Um, what does having an extra constituent that you aren't aware of do to the network? How does it impact it for instance if there's an extra sink or source for carbon that you're not aware of? Um, it depends on the network. Like I said, for example, even when we knocked out acetylene, it didn't really change the amount of methane, but it did change the amount of the network metrics quite significantly. Um, so it depends on basically how, well, yeah, basically how reactive that missing species is. If it doesn't play a lot of roles, um, which is the case for the majority of um, species present in the atmospheres, at least when you're looking at a network approach, um, it may not make that much of a difference. But if it turns out it's really important, you know, if we were to somehow not include ammonia, you know, looking at, a, you know, say Titan or an Archean Earth even, um, that could, you know, cause a lot of issues. Um, so yeah, it, it, uh, I can't really give you like a generalized answer because it's gonna vary from atmosphere to atmosphere, I suspect. I guess you could include an upper limit or something. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is just based off of the constituents that we can observe and we do think are likely to be there. Um, the chemists have sat down and figured out, okay, this is what's likely to actually be occurring. Um, but again, something, you know, uh, going back to Megan's point that one of the things I want to do is like, okay, what happens if you just remove, not from the actual like modeled atmosphere, but remove species from the network representation, they're going to look different, but can you still distinguish them whether or not they have life or not? Okay, last call for question. I mean, Tessa's here, so we can, uh, you can always start off yeah. being, and you guys, especially, we just came up with a really awesome idea with Everett uh, next week. So, um, if there's no other question, I will say thank you, Tessa. Thank you. And we'll see you next week. Yep, looking forward to it.